I'm here to talk to you today about responsive web designs the next decade. Hello everyone, my name is Ethan Marcotte. I'm an independent designer based in the United States. Uh, I'm Beep on Twitter. Now 2020, well, it had a lot of things going on in it, but it had one special moment in it for me because on May 25th, I had a little bit of a milestone because 10 years ago, something rather significant happened in my career, which is I published a little article called Responsive Web Design. Now, in the article, I proposed that there was a new way of thinking about designing for the web. That the web is really, if you think about it, the first truly flexible design medium. There's never been anything quite like it. But at the time I wrote the article, we were still thinking about designing for the web in terms of siloing our experiences to different devices. Designing separate mobile experiences, separate desktop websites, separate tablet websites. And what I proposed in the article was that we could design across those experiences using the flexibility baked into the heart of the web as a design asset, as a strength. Now in the article, I put forward a very high level overview of what makes a design responsive. And it basically just boils down to three distinct ingredients. First and foremost, there's a fluid or flexible grid that's built with proportions rather than inflexible pixels. There are flexible images and media that work within those flexible layouts. And then finally, there are media queries, which are a little bit of pixie dust from the CSS3 specification that allow us to articulate how and when those flexible layouts need to change their shape to adapt to the changing size of a screen or respond to a differently sized display. Now that was then, all the way back in 2010. Now if we fast forward 10 years, the landscape looks dramatically different. Because I have to be perfectly honest with you, it feels very weird being the guy talking about responsive design over a decade later. I fully believe, I mean, I just, I wrote an article. But since that time, so many designers and agencies and businesses and brands and publications I deeply respect and admire ran with the idea to an extent that I never could have imagined. And across nearly every industry, from personal blogs and portfolio sites to large travel uh, outlets, to media reach event sites, to e-commerce sites, each one of them began to adopt responsive design and learned that the flexibility baked into the web is a real strength that we can leverage when we're designing for more devices and contexts than ever before. And as they experimented with the responsive design, they started to share lessons about how it changed their practice internally, how it brought different disciplines closer together. And in doing so, they were able to build more effectively across all the complexity that we're being asked to manage on a daily basis. In other words, as an industry, in the last 10 years, we've started to develop a vocabulary for how design is evolving into this new, weird, post-desktop landscape we're all trying to reckon with. But there's one question that I still hear from every client that I work with or every company that I speak with on a daily basis, and that is, so what happens next? Now, just to be clear, when I hear this question, there's usually a little bit of fear in the eyes of the person asking it. Because if you think about it, we've been asked to deal with a considerable amount of change and complexity just in the last 10 years. And it's still changing to this day. I mean, mobile, which sort of kicked off the whole responsive discussion, is still exploding. According to some estimates, there are nearly 8 billion mobile devices estimated to be in use worldwide. Now, tablets are still, relatively speaking, a newer browsing context, and we're still working on the best way to design for them. But they're still incredibly popular. Now, this statistic's a few years older, but it still floors me that in 2011 alone, some 80 new tablet devices entered the marketplace in one 12-month period. That's staggering. And, of course, there's been a considerable amount of investment in trying to understand what else might be out there that we should start thinking about designing for. So smart TVs, smart watches, other kinds of wearable. There's an incredible amount of excitement around this question. What happens next? But here's the problem with that question. I know I, for one, can't possibly answer it. And I don't think anybody really can. We don't know where we're going. But the one thing that I do know is that in the last 10 years, responsive design's three main ingredients haven't changed. Every responsive layout is still built today with flexible grids, flexible images, and media queries. But the details around every single one of those ingredients have changed in a million different wonderful ways. So with that in mind, let's look at some of them. Over the course of this talk, I want to actually use the homepage of a fictitious magazine that I've designed called The Viewport.
to look at some of the ways in which responsive design has changed, stayed the same, but also of the many ways that it's changed or has become different. So using this simple design, we'll look at individual pieces of this layout and look at how to implement it now in 2020. And in doing so, we're going to review those three ingredients of a responsive design, fluid grids, fluid images, and media queries. And we're going to look at some of the new ways that we can use today to create them. So as we look through them, you're going to learn new ways to build responsive designs today. And that's going to help you better prepare your products for the challenges in front of you tomorrow. So with that in mind, let's get started. Let's begin right at the top with fluid grids. Now, in continuing our flashback tour, I'm going to bring you all the way back to the original article. And this was sort of the sample design that I worked on back in 2010 to show how responsive design could actually work, how you could marry fluid grids and media queries to build these flexible layouts that could change their shape, change their presentation, change the placement of information on the page to better suit the amount of space available to them in a viewport. Now, there's a lot of excitement around the dramatic ways in which a responsive design can adapt using media queries. But really, the workhorse of a responsive design is the fluid grid. In other words, we're moving away from pixels and defining our layouts and coming up with grid-based designs that are completely proportional, that move in synchronicity in a pleasing and harmonious way. So in other words, every responsive design has to begin with a flexible foundation. And that helps us better design across all these different devices and contexts that we're being asked to reckon with on a daily basis. What's more, we have new remarkable tools for creating that flexible foundation. And I want to talk about two of them with you today, specifically Flexbox and the CSS Grid Layout Model. So let's start with Flexbox. Now Flexbox, or the Flexible Box Model, basically is a way to control the distribution of a container's elements along an axis. I realize that sounds a little confusing, but let me show you a very simple example from the Viewport's homepage. Specifically, I'd like to draw your attention to the masthead that appears at the very top of the page, which just contains the logo and the primary navigation. Now, the primary navigation is marked up as a list in the HTML, but we can actually override its default presentation and define it as a flexible box by setting its display property to flex. And then we can also set a flex direction of row, and this establishes the axis along which other elements inside the flexible box are laid out. So with the flex direction property set to row, the axis follows the row, and then the elements inside the flex box are laid out across it. Now we can actually reuse the same mechanic for the entire masthead as well. We can set the masthead to display flex, establishing our flexible box, and then we can set the flex direction to row again, laying out elements along that axis. Now you'll notice that these two elements are actually dramatically removed from each other along that axis, one on the left, one on the right. That's because of this third property that we've set. Justify content space between ensures that there's, well, enough space between the elements and distributes them evenly along the axis. Now, the first item will always lay flush against the starting edge of our flex box, and the last item will always be flush against the ending edge. Now, since there are only two elements inside of our flex box, this is a very easy way to push them to opposing ends of their container. Now, what's incredibly powerful about flex box is that it can work along a vertical axis as well. So let's turn away from the masthead and actually bring our attention closer to the bottom of the page where we're promoting different blog entries that we've been publishing in the magazine. So each one of these teasers for an individual article is built with flex box in a similar manner to what we just did with the masthead. The teaser is basically has a background color attached to it, and its display property is also set to flex. Now you might notice that we're not actually specifying flex direction row here because that's actually the default value of flex direction. So with that in mind, we've still got an axis moving across the horizontal axis of the box, and that's where the two main pieces of content are laid out on along that axis. So the image appears on the left, and the teaser content appears on the right. Now the content of the teaser itself though is also set to be a flexible box with the display flex property. But here we're actually setting flex direction to column to establish a vertical axis from top to bottom. And then the individual elements inside of there are laid out along that axis. Now you'll notice here that there's a massive gap between the headline and the byline that appears closer to the bottom of the box. That's because we've set the flex grow property on the headline to one. 
which basically tells it as a flexible item to occupy as much space as it can along the axis, pushing the contents closer to the bottom and ensuring the headline occupies as much space as possible inside its Flexbox container. So we've just scratched the surface of some of the things that Flexbox can do for us in a responsive design. Remember, it's basically just about controlling the distribution of elements along an axis of a container. Now CSS Grid is a different beast entirely. It allows us to lay out content in rows and columns within a container. Now before we dive into code, let's just take a really brief look at some of the different mechanics of what a CSS Grid does and how they work together. So if you've worked with any kind of grid in a traditional design application or building one in HTML and CSS, a grid is basically usually constructed of columns, right? And those are often separated from gutters between them. And that's very true in CSS Grid as well. There are columns and gutters. But just as well, there are also rows that can be separated by gutters along the vertical axis from top to bottom. So let's see how that can actually work in practice. Here's a very simple demo, uh, just rigged up in some basic HTML. So let's say we have a container element that has a bunch of simple little uh, elements inside of it that just contain the little snippets of text. Now by default, because of uh, the way which blocks will flow and content, those pieces of content will just stack on top of each other. But if we change the dis uh, container from a block level item into a grid, we can set its display property to grid and then using the grid template columns property, we can set up a column or we can set up a grid of four columns, each set to 100 pixels. So with that in place, we've pretty dramatically changed the presentation of the information inside of that container. We're no longer stacking these items on top of each other, but rather they're automatically getting slotted into those individual 100 pixel wide columns and then flowing down to a second row when they exceed the width of their container. Now, if we'd like to have a little bit of spacing between those items, we can use the grid gap property and say, space them out by 10 pixels. And the nice thing about the grid gap property is that it's actually a shorthand property that uh, expands out to grid column gap and grid row gap. So if you'd like to control those two uh, spaces independently, that's an option to you as well. Now, what we've been looking at so far is seeing at how these items automatically reflow through the grid by default but we can override that behavior and actually specify different placements for those elements using properties like grid column end. So for example, if I wanted to accord a little bit more prominence to one of these items, I could say grid column end span to, to ensure that that element is actually spanning two columns. Now I should probably pause here and just take a moment because what we're doing here isn't actually spanning two columns. In fact, let's take a closer look at how our grid is constructed. So in our grid, we have, as we uh, established before, four separate columns. But once we defined that grid, we also defined a set of grid lines that run across the grid from left to right, each one of them bounding off one of those columns. Now those are also numbered, and we can refer to those numbered indexes when we're laying out individual grid items. So for example, if we have an individual grid item inside of our container, we can say we want its grid column to end at three and three refers to a specific grid line, a specific column line. Using grid column end three, we can then say to that item, we want you to expand your width until you've reached that third grid line. We can also change the initial placement of the item. Let's say grid column start two and grid column end five. And that'll ensure that that item begins at the second grid line and ends at the fifth one. Now, we could also be a little bit less precise. We can use the span keyword to basically determine how many lines from the opposite edge this particular grid item should span. So here, we want it to span three lines. So if we're starting from two, we would then end at five. We can actually even collapse all this CSS a little bit further and move it down into the individual grid column property, which is just a shorthand value that allows us to specify the start and ending positions.